Are you surprised that rec use, adult use, uh, has not been passed yet within the state of Florida? Hey, everyone. Welcome to our latest Trade of Black podcast. I am your host, Shad Dales. Let's welcome in our two co-hosts of the podcast, Anthony Barrell, Millennial Entrepreneur. Anthony, good to see you. Good to see you, sir. How's it going? Good. Benjamin A. Smith, lead financial writer. Good to see you. How are things? Things are very well. Thank you. How are things over there? Not bad. A lot of movement. Let's, you know, let's stop, start off the top. Psychedelics. Wow. For an industry that was pretty quiet. We've had announcement after announcement this calendar year, including big announcement from the uh, country of Australia last week, where the TGA, which is basically their uh, government agency, similar to uh, the FDA, uh, they're going to allow psychiatrists to begin prescribing both MDMA and psilocybin for people with PTSD and depression beginning July 1st, Ben. What was your reaction when you heard this news? Oh, the reaction, it, it was like a, it was a bombshell. That's the best way that I can describe it. We uh, received the news uh, late that night. It actually came out around uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time, and I was up doing some content. And it, it, as soon as it hit the wires, it was like it was like, I knew right away the significance of it. Um, this is actually very precedent setting for a Western country, uh, Commonwealth country no. to approve something like this, uh, you know, to approve psilocybin uh, applications and MDNA applications for depression and PTSD respectively. That's That hasn't been done anywhere in the world. Uh, so, I mean, this is not... Uh, you know, it's not something that's going to be applied to everybody right away. It's not going to displace Prozac and all the SSRIs right away. But what it does is open the door to uh, to these sort of therapies and gives them runway to operate. And it also, uh, the agency also acknowledged that uh, they're having difficulty uh, with other, with the existing options to treat these conditions. So with that acknowledgement, along with this, uh, you know, I can only describe it as a bombshell, and hopefully uh, other agencies around the world will follow. Anthony, did you read much about the story? Like, what was your reaction when you heard about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's great, but I mean, at, at face value, I mean, the thing that I was really curious to see is, is who's actually sourcing the MDMA and the psilocybin, and I mean, who's making money off of, off of prescribing it? Because um, I'm assuming it's not traditional drug companies in Australia mm-hmm. that, are, that are kind mm-hmm. of like where, like Ben, where are they getting it from? And like, where is like, who's, who's sourcing this since it's, it's literally in it's like, let's call it illicit form. I'm assuming judging by what I read from the release, you know, that that's, that's, a, that's actually a really good question because, um, you're like right. Map, it's, it's not like would it's ma- comp- would maps have anything to do with that. I'm sorry. Would maps have anything to do with that? Uh, right now, I don't, there's no indication that they do. Um, and I think Anthony asked a good question, like, where is it coming from? You know, it's not like it's compasses comp 360 going in there or a a specific NCE. Uh, the press release only mentioned psilocybin and MDMA. So I don't know who's actually sourcing that. And then if they are, if it just comes like generically from some company that, you know, makes that, uh, compound, what does it do? Like, what does it mean for the the companies over here that are trying to get their own specific compounds into the mix when PTA, PAT is, is eventually sourced over here, eventually allowed? Is it going to be more of a generic thing or is it going to be you know a specific uh, new chemical entity that is going to dominate the market? So I think there's mm-hmm. a lot of still a lot of questions, but I think mm-hmm. the big takeaway right now is that psilocybin therapy. Um, MDMA assisted therapy is allowed and the door is now wide open for other agencies like the FDA, as Rick Doblin mentioned before that he thinks MDMA assisted therapy will happen next year. The door is wide open for other agencies to look at that model and say, yes, okay, it works. Let's approve it over here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a great announcement. I think it's obviously progress, but I think it just adds to the opacity, um, around this entire sector, which is something that we're trying to just decode here, uh, week in and week out. Well, uh, I did have a couple conversations. Health Canada is watching this closely. So interesting to see if they actually make the same announcement at some point later this year. Um, but do you guys overall feel with this announcement that you'll see more and more G7 countries, Anthony, uh, move towards this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't understand why Canada wouldn't quickly. If in British Columbia now they're literally administering heroin and opiates. Yeah um at at the at like the 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 convenience store level um basically so i mean if you're gonna do that 
there's no way you're going to stonewall or really impede progress on doing therapeutic um, ther- th- therapeutic sessions with MDMA and with psilocybin. Yeah. Ben, yeah. Um, Rick yeah, Dobbin, no, I say I agree with that. To... Go ahead. Sorry, Ben. No, I was saying I was just going to echo Anthony's statements. I totally agree with that. Um, it, at the very least, what it allows for is for these other agencies like the FDA to gather data and see how that program is working. And assuming that program is working well and there's no hiccups and problems, adverse effects with the patient population, then, you know, it, it opens the door for them to look at that data and say, yeah, yes, it works. And let's approve it over here. I almost got the impression that when Rick Dalvin was on Fox Business News a couple of weeks ago, I think he was being very conservative with regards to MDMA being approved by the FDA by Q2 2024. Based off of last week's announcement, Ben, do you think it happens quicker? I see you shaking your head, uh, Anthony. In the United States? Yeah. You, think it ta- you, no. you don't think it happens within that timeline? No. Longer? You're not going to get... I, I don't think you're going to get politicians to pass illicit drugs in their pure form through the FDA. Like we can't even get recreational cannabis passed in Florida. Mm-hmm. You're not going to, there's so many, I mean, if the legislative body in this country wasn't all above the age of 60 and probably still thoroughly ingrained and believe in like the war on drugs. Yeah. I think Rick's pretty much spot on, but let's be real. I mean, all of the politicians that are running everything and making these decisions they hear MDMA, they hear psilocybin, they run for the hills and just think it's some street party drug. And they're all in bed with the pharma lobby. So, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Ben, what's your thoughts when Anthony brings up the whole idea of comparing cannabis and, and psychedelics? We have this conversation a lot with executives in the psychedelic space, and it's something that makes them cringe being compared to cannabis because of the data that's being produced. Uh, is it fair to compare the two uh, industries and to Anthony's point? Uh, have it delayed being, uh, you know, processed and pushed forward by the FDA based on what he thinks? Well, I think Anthony's got a point with the skepticism, as we've seen in the cannabis industry. Uh, it's taken forever uh, to approve, uh, you know, recreational cannabis and to allow the normalization of the industry in the United States. And most people think that, you know, big pharma, the big pharma lobby has something to do with it. And the the politicians reluctance to approve it because of that. So he does have a point there. I would say that, you know, probably uh, this has a better chance of going through more quickly because they're more uh, specialized conditions, right? Like they're not like, you know, cannabis is, would be a threat to the whole opioid industry, which is, uh, you know, quite a large industry. And this is more specific conditions that have no hope of being treated through existing measures. So there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, you know, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised after Australia went through if the FDA looked at that da- data, if it was, you know, completely conclusive and there's no adverse effects in the patient population, um, that they go ahead and, you know, prescribe it to specific people. So you got to remember, unlike cannabis, which can be acquired by anybody, these are very, very specific uh, case cases in which patients are treated. It's not like a widespread um you know, application right away. So the threat to big lobby, I don't know if it's to the same degree as, you know, widespread canvas application, for example. All right. So with the announcement last week in Australia, um, you're going to probably see, well, you will see uh, a lot of clinics uh, with the proper treatment taking place, the proper therapist being uh, appointed, which is going to be a big undertaking to say the least. But if you see someone like Health Canada and FDA push this through within the next 12 months, You almost get the feeling that, yes, drug development is going to be an important one with the industry, but a lot of companies focusing on the clinical model uh, could see some short-term growth, uh, big growth opportunities. If so, like, do you think that's a fair assessment, Ben? And if so, so what are some of the companies that you think could uh, benefit from this? Yeah, no, I think that's a totally fair assessment. I think the first kind of companies that will benefit will be the therapeutic uh, outpatient therapeutic providers such as Numinous. And I say this because uh, if this therapy, similar therapies are approved in North America, you're probably going to have companies like, say, MAPS um, have exclusivity with the production of MDMA for PTSD, for example, right? You're not going to have the, the public companies like uh, Compass Pathways right away 
delve into uh, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy until their specific compound, in this case, COMP360, goes through the FDA process and they go through phase three them, themselves. So that's why I, think, I tend to think the numinuses, the clinics, outpatient therapy companies are going to benefit because they'll receive their psilocybin. They'll receive their MDMA yeah. from other companies like MAPS who, who have already gone through the phase three and will have some sort of exclusivity to deliver the drug to these companies. Hmm. Well, interesting to see uh, how it develops, but uh, good overall for uh, the industry as it uh, continues to progress. Uh, Anthony, you brought up cannabis before, and uh, the state of Florida, a uh, political campaign by Smart and Safe Florida backed, has collected enough signatures to require the Florida Supreme Court to review a proposed ballot measure. Momentum is building that adult use cannabis uh, question will make the 2024 ballot. Um, can you maybe touch on what you think this overall means for the state when it comes to rec use and what we could be looking at timeline wise and, and if it indeed will happen, I think it will happen. Yeah. I mean, I think it's great. I mean, we've seen it before on the ballot. This conversation has been going on for the past three or four years. I mean, the fact of the matter is this isn't California. Um, this isn't New York. This isn't Colorado. It's not Washington and it sure as hell ain't Oregon. I mean, it's Florida. Like Florida is very red and it's very conservative when you get out of South Florida. Um, a lot of the politicians don't want this. Um, companies like True Leave, companies like Move, I mean, they had to fight to get retail locations in certain areas due to municipalities not wanting medical um, there. Counties like uh, Sarasota, Tampa, um, they were very cannabis averse. Um, I don't really see it passing this time around. Why? Um, I don't think that anything's, I mean, I, I don't think the support's there. You've got companies like Publix, um, that's the number one grocer in the state. They donate a ton of money um, to the anti-cannabis lobby to protect their pharmacy business. Um, all, a lot of the politicians here, like I said, they're, they're red. This isn't a very blue leaning state. Um, I think that uh, adult use is going to be very hard to get over the hill. Um, I'm sure if we have Brady on, he'll probably mimic the same sentiment that, 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 that I'm sharing. Um, I wish it would pass. I think it's about time it passes. But just like federal legalization, I mean, don't speculate. Show me. Um, I'll believe it when it happens. Okay, I'm but Anthony, that, correct me right. if I'm wrong. But if this <clears throat> if this measure gets, if assuming it, it it passes the review from the Florida Supreme Court, if this measure ultimately ends up getting 891,000 signatures, uh, doesn't it automatically go on the 2024 ballot? Uh, automatically and then goes to the voters yes but then i'm i'm pretty sure it can be i don't want to say vetoed there's another word for the process but i'm sure it could be appealed or brought that uh somebody can put an injunction mm -hmm. on it um regardless um florida florida's florida i mean it's it's pay for play unless it's getting a bunch of money and there's a lot of pro of uh contributions flying around i don't really see this getting getting passed are you surprised that rec use, adult use, uh, has not been passed yet within the state of Florida? No, not at all. At all. Like I said, I mean, it's it, Florida's a conservative state. It's very red. Florida is the south when you get out of Palm Beach. Like, all the way up to the panhandle. Like, south Florida is very, is very mixed. <laughs> it leans more, it leans more blue. And even the conservatives that are down here yeah. are more center yeah. than right. But Florida, when you get outside of South Florida, and with the exception of Tampa and maybe some pockets of Orlando, is very, very mm. right-leaning conservative country. How big is the, uh, what, there's 21 million people in Florida? Do you know how big the yeah. uh, medicinal market is in the state? Patient-wise? Yeah. I haven't looked recently, but I mean, if I had to guess somewhere in between seven and 800K right now, as far as patients go. So, I mean, you're looking at less than 5% of the population. Yeah, but how big is that rec market? <laughs> using a medicinal oh the rec market would be the bit the rec market would be top three in the oh, country yeah, for sure but i think even currently right now like how many people have how difficult is it to get a medicinal card in the state of florida i could call the place right i could call the place right now and have a card in two or three yeah. days oh it's fun. i mean but okay but hold on what you're saying now is a completely different conversation because i think that medical marijuana as a system is the biggest fucking farce in the world all of my friends that have medical cards they're recreationally smoking. Yeah. They don't have a medical condition. They walk in and they say, doc, I've got anxiety or I can't sleep. 
and they just go, all right, here's your card. Go get whatever you want. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a joke. Yeah. I mean, the Florida, with the exception of some, some patients, I mean, I know organizations in Tampa and I know guys that have been around from the beginning that do thoroughly progress the narrative as cannabis, as a therapeutic substance. And they do make sure that patients that do qualify and that do need it, get that care. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a certain portion of the population that does use it medically, but it's it's a Trojan horse. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, medical has always been just standardized rack, Yeah. Um, as far as the system yeah, goes. Yeah, and that's the perception it leaves. Um, yeah. I'd be curious to see, like, you're in a hot market right now. We are in a surplus market. Um, is there any trends, you know, with uh, what you're seeing or hearing within the state of Florida and how the overall industry is progressing? If so, like, what are, oh, what yeah. are some notable things that, uh, like, it grabs your attention about the market? In the past, in the past year and a half, I mean, Cookies is here. Jungle Boys is here. 710 is here. Um, the Cali brands and the West Coast brands that have premium product, they're all penetrating the state. I mean, Brady's new venture at Sunburn I would consider a top of the cone retail experience really? as well as a consumer product. Um, this market is maturing as far as a product market goes. And those bigger brands are finally making their stay. Um, that being said, I mean, it's not getting any more access, more easily accessible. Um, but if I had to guess people like junk uh, companies, like jungle boys, companies like cookies, um, companies like sunburn, they are going to start to eat away and erode at the market share that true leave has on the state. Have you been to a sunburn <clears throat> cannabis store? Uh, I'm not a marketing expert, but I, I mean, don't, I don't have my med. I, I don't have my medical card. Oh, you don't. Okay. I, I just no. walk away impressed I've by their, them. by their marketing. Uh, you know, the sort of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, throwback 80s, 70s, 80s kind of style to, uh, I don't know. It seems like a different marketing campaign than a lot of the Got current companies are doing orange. right now. Well, I mean, what Brady's doing is what I've been saying myself since like 2016 like i was a part of like a lot of groups that were trying to get licenses and the thesis behind that license was start an east coast brand start a brand that represents florida cannabis not this sanitized corporate right. entity like true leave or like a lot of the entities that you see in in florida um i mean uh, brady's building a brand brady's building a, an east coast cannabis company yeah. which i think is needed to be done um, he's doing a great job at it. The guys over at Flowery um, are kind of doing the same thing. They're the ones that brought 710 into Florida. They want to have a Florida brand, an East Coast cannabis brand. Um, I think what they're doing is, is 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 great, and ultimately it's going to win the consumer moving forward. Do you not think that's the biggest missing element amongst the big MSOs right now? Yeah, the big MSOs suck. Uh -huh. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I invest in them, and I love them because they make sense. I mean, they make a lot of money. But as far as branding goes and as far as product goes and as far as like <clears throat> identifying with the consumer, I think they missed that completely. completely. You know who did do a very good job with that, but they're in a shambles right now is MedMen. MedMen had a very good retail experience. MedMen had very good branding. Yeah. MedMen just happened to have absolutely terrible operators yeah. that all they wanted to do was extract value out of their shareholder base and their company. They did that. And now the company's floundering. I mean, Brady bought the MedMen license that was for sale in Florida yeah. as, a, as a distressed asset. I'd be curious to see, like, um, and feel free to chime in with any questions, Ben, or any uh, feedback. But um, when you said you sat there, you're, you were amongst a group of uh, people that was trying to obtain licenses within the state of Florida. Um, walk me through, I guess, the strategy that you guys would put into place to obtain those. So the same thing, the, 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 the process for getting a license in Florida has always been pretty arduous. What they are, they're, as we all know, they're super vertical. So that license comes with retail, processing, manufacturing, distribution. You get the one license and you can do fucking everything that you want within the state. However, like I said, when we were talking about adult use coming online, Florida, it's pay for play. So if you want to do an application process... You need about $25 million in capital just to put on the sidelines to have for proof of CapEx. You also need to go tie up retail locations that are going to burn cash. You need to have a cultivation site. Wow. You need to have about $2 million <clears throat> in capital to just do the formation process of the application. And then you need to get everybody from soup to nuts 
on the application that's going to appeal with Tallahassee. So you need to get preferably a Florida billionaire that's in the citrus industry, preferably someone that knows DeSantis, preferably someone that also knows Coppola, who was the head of the Department of Health in Florida up until about a year ago. Um, you need to stack that deck so it appeals. And then you also need to have all of the assets in place paired with somebody that can come from the West Coast and build out a ground up operation just to have a fighting chance to get that application. That being said, the reason why we stopped pursuing licenses was because every time there was some forward uh, momentum in the process, someone would sue and then the licenses would basically be stopped dead in their tracks. And then there was also black farmers that were thrown in. It's been a complete clusterfuck for about the past six wow. years. Did so, you check off all? Go ahead, Ben. So every so it's like how it operates in Florida is no different than a lot of other states, right? There's, there's all these hurdles. It's it's big money that has preference because ton if, of hurdles. Once you, if you don't have money, you don't have millions of dollars and boys that are friends with the guys up in Tallahassee. Unless you're insanely lucky and happen to have a very sound business plan, and you get lucky with the person that reviews that application, you're not. That's not so right. Works, obviously. It shouldn't be that way. That's how th that's how stuff's way, but that's how stuff's done around the way here. It works, and it's like that. In a I mean, of literally, a Florida a Florida cannabis license is a license to print money. Yeah. Did you check off all those boxes with everything? You I'm not going to get into detail <laughs> on that, but yeah, pretty much. Huh. Um, last thing I want to touch on. Great stuff. I love that feedback. Um, leave a comment below. Actually, ask questions. Anything you want to hear about uh, Anthony's little venture when it came to uh, obtaining licenses and stuff like that with uh, cannabis. But interesting uh, market to say the least. I want to switch uh, now. Last thing, uh, crypto, um, Binance. Basically, uh, they're no longer going to be able to transfer U.S. dollars from bank accounts into the exchange to buy and sell cryptocurrency. Uh, real quick. Anthony, how should we read into this announcement? What does this mean? Why? So it's a good, it's a good shock and awe headline. When you really read into it, it's Binance, not Binance US. Right. And the reason for it is Binance's international arm that some US users do use. If you have a VPN, you can connect to it. But they have a clearing bank that now is going, and they have a clearing bank that's issuing a mandate that in order to um, remit money off of Binance into a US bank, it's a hundred thousand dollar minimum. So they're figuring this out. And in the grand scheme of things, when Binance announced this, they had about 172 million of assets withdrawn from the platform that went to competitors or other uh, cold storage um, solutions. They've got about $46 billion in assets on the exchange. Wow. I mean, this Binance US, I mean, Binance International doesn't eat, sleep and breathe off of the US trader or the US consumer. It's heavy, heavy international. Um, while this, if this headline came out during the SBF mania, there'd probably be a run on Binance right now. And like CNBC would even be running with it. But as far as I'm concerned, unless this accelerates or becomes something worse, it's completely benign right now. So this is, it's just a headline. This is just clickbait material then. Yeah. Interesting right, stuff. La last thing I want to chime in since we're talking about Binance is we've had like a, a, a very material bounce in, in Coinbase right? A Binance competitor, which is uh, one and two in, in terms of exchange, uh, large S, if you want to call it. Uh, uh, Coinbase is number two, Binance is number one. It's almost, it's actually doubled over the past, say, month. And it's uh, right around, trading right around 70 uh, right now. Would you be a buyer of Coinbase shares right now, given the bounce and given that it seems that some people are putting their, you're starting to put their Bitcoin back on the exchanges? Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, especially with Gemini and with DCG just completely looking like nitwits, um, to, to put it quite frank, Coinbase is pretty much the only game in town if you want to use a CEX in the United States. Like, they are the gold standard. Like, the two of the best trades that I've made in the stock market um, in the last year was buying Meta at 94 and then buying Coinbase at 56. Mm. Um I'm holding both of those still. Uh, Meta's doubled since I bought it. I think Coinbase will continue to trend. I mean, if anything, we've seen crypto be semi-resilient. It's now back to the levels it was before FTX. It's getting back consumer confidence. People are forgetting price appreciation's going up. 
The NFT market is starting to become liquid again. People are starting to tiptoe back into crypto. If the general public does, and if we see another leg up and new users come in, Coinbase is going to be the sole beneficiary of the U.S. Um, of, of the U.S. investor coming back in. And I'm going to give you your props on Coinbase. I'm going to give you your props on Meta because it was looking extremely ugly at one point during that huge downtrend. And I was like, Anthony, are you sure you, you know what's going on? I'm, I'm not a big follower of, of the metaverse and all that, so I'm not an expert. Hate, and you you called it. You, I hate You Facebook. basically nailed the bottom. So what's the result yeah, of the turnaround I, then? So I absolutely hate Facebook. And the reason why I bought Meta was Zuckerberg came out on the earnings call and basically just said whatever he wanted. He, it was almost as if he wanted to drop the stock. He doubled down on his metaverse spending. He didn't address a lot of key concerns. And then Wall Street was kind of like, well, it's a confidence issue in Mark Zuckerberg. I don't like Mark Zuckerberg. I don't like Facebook, but I'm smart enough to realize Zuckerberg's probably the smartest guy in the room wherever he goes. Like he's, he's, I, 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 I trust him as an investor. Yeah. He did everything that was right. He still is doubling down on the metaverse, but he righted the ship. He's got reels going in the right direction. He's doing a stock buyback. Like he's done everything from that bottom to get the stock to where it is. And I think it's, it's above a buck 80 right now today. So do you think this um, was a So, I mean, I'm, was this a finger yeah. to wall street with his strategy then? You could say that, but I mean, it's not here nor there and we'll never be able to really prove that. But I mean, it's one thing that, I mean, Zuck is, he's an operator. He's not going anywhere. And I think Facebook is going to be a formidable competitor in the tech space mm -hmm. for years to come. Interesting. All right, guys, we'll check with you later this week. But before, I want to get your pick for the game later this week in our uh, podcast uh, later uh, on Friday. But for now, over under 50 and a half, Chiefs Eagles, what are you picking? You first, Anthony. <laughs> I don't know. Because you talked about that defense. I'm going to go over because everyone's probably going to go under. Is the under that high? What I thought scares the, me, the over under was 46. What, what was the score? What, what scares me the most was the Eagles pass offense against the Niners was fucking terrible. All of their touchdowns, I'm pretty sure, were rushing touchdowns. And they didn't do anything really through the air. Kansas City's defense isn't as good as the Niners, but it's pretty damn close. That's the thing. I've been so uh, blurred by their offense all year. I've never really watched closely their defense. Their defensive line is strong, obviously, after what I saw against Very. the Bengals game. But their secondary strong as well? Yeah. I mean, the K Kansas City has a pretty damn good defense. That being said... I'm always going to bet on Mahomes to light up another team. The Eagles arguably have the best defensive line in the league. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think this game is going to be very interesting, but I'm going to take the over just because everyone else is taking How's the under. Chiefs offensive line? Couldn't tell you really. But, I mean, they, they protected the shit out of Mahomes when he was injured last I th two weeks ago. I think ago. it's over. I think it's over. Yeah, I'm, the I'm line's been the trending up. I'm taking the over in the I Chiefs. think it opened at around 48, yeah. and now it's at 50 and a half. So I'll, the general public believes it's over. It keeps incrementally pushing it up. So I just don't see. It's hard to say I keep that going back and forth in this game. I don't know who to pick. In order for it to go over, one of the whoever wins is going to have to put up over 30. Yeah, well, I think that's a daunting task for either team against either of those offenses. I do too. I do too. I also think that Mahomes is going to walk into that stadium like Joe Cool, and Jalen Hurts might be a little nervous. Yeah, I definitely think, uh, well, I'm not going to make my pick yet, but history has shown that, yeah, anyone with experience, even though uh, Mahomes had been to the Super Bowl before, Brady schooled him a couple years ago, but then you got Nick Foles. <laughs> Last Eagles yeah. championship walked in and basically schooled Brady. But, you know, I mean, that team was also that team was ridiculous top to bottom with the exception of Nick Foles. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy to think that they had Carson Wentz, uh, who injured himself yeah. towards the end of the year, was on pace to win the MVP. Maybe he won the MVP that year. And now this guy, five years later, is on the verge of being out of the NFL. Yeah. I mean, the NFL's the NFL's cutthroat. Yeah. 
Um, okay, gents, good feedback. Love the Florida stories and uh, good st- uh, stuff as well, Ben, with, uh, with regards to updates on the psychedelic space. We'll watch your LinkedIn uh, profile on uh, how that's progressing. And uh, I know there's a lot of uh, qualified people within the industry that are leaning on you for direction and advice, but uh, appreciate the feedback. And we'll check back in with you guys later this week. Right. Good stuff. Thank you guys. Okay. Cheers. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. And if you want to learn more about the emerging industries that we cover, then leave a comment below and let us know who you want us to interview, the questions you want asked, and the information that you want to learn. We want to hear from you. As usual, click on that bell for all notifications to get the latest information. Share this video with your network. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.